I started Saskatchewan Orienteering Association when I moved to Saskatchewan uh, in this fall. And uh, I'm trained in Alberta. So I um, took orienteering coaching courses in Alberta. I also taught uh, orienteering in Alberta um, and coached orienteering there for a few years before I moved here. So when I came here, there was nothing in terms of orienteering. And I felt that I needed to change that. And uh, I'm hoping for the next few years that I will build a fairly strong program throughout the whole province. So um, because we are so many, I don't think I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself. I feel like that will take a little too long time. Um, what I wanna focus on is talking about what, I, what orienteering is, what the benefits are, why I want you to try it, um, and how to prepare for orienteering activities. Uh, I want you to leave here knowing or thinking that you actually can um, do an activity in your school or with your organization or even at home. We're gonna talk about equipment that you need. So maps and controls, and that's pretty much all you need, which is the, which is the beauty of, of orienteering. We're gonna talk about how to make a basic orienteering map if you find that there is nothing for your area, which probably it's likely that you don't find anything. Uh, how to run an orienteering activity. We're gonna talk about the steps that goes before you actually uh, execute your activity. And we'll talk about a few variations of activities that you can run. And then we'll go to resources a little bit later. And then you can always stay a little bit later if you have extra questions that you want to talk to me about. So to begin with, what is orienteering? What is it all about? Um, so it's quite simple, really. It's not a very complicated sport, but there's a lot of sort of add-ons that you can add on once you feel like your children or participants are getting better and better. Really, the goal is to locate a series of checkpoints called controls using a map. Um, and uh, so as you see in this picture here, the controls that we're talking about, the checkpoints, are usually hung in trees or bush bushes or uh, other objects in the, in the area. And then kids are finding them using the map. So in a way, it's quite similar to geocaching. But of course, in this case, we're using a paper map as opposed to a, um, a phone or a, G, um, a GPS. So as I said, there's quite a few add-ons. So for example, when the participants are getting better, you might want to time the races. You want to maybe time the, the, the or uh, measure the time that it takes for them to, to complete the course. Or you might want to add complex terrain. You might want to go to new areas with uh, terrain such as forests and streams and lakes and boulders and hills and stuff like that. So that, that, that makes it a lot more complex than if you, of course, use um, a smaller area or a, a city park or a school ground. So lots of variations. Um, so lots of benefits, which is really why, again, I wanted to try this. Um, children, of course, will learn um, reading a map, which is a great skill to bring with them later on, right? Uh, being able to match symbols of the map with the surrounding area um, learning cardinal directions and other spatial skills and directional skills, distance and figuring out where they are in an environment. Even a lot of adults find these kind of things very difficult. So very useful for kids and fun. Um, now, because our interior is not only body, using your body, but using your mind, um, children will practice problem solving logical thinking, decision-making. So for example, in this little area here, you can see uh, an orienteering map. And um, this is control one and control two. And of course, this particular activity, you're going to have the kids going from control one to control two, but there is a stream here. So they may or may not be able to go the shortest way. So in orienteering, not only are you running from one control to another, but you're figuring out how to fastest and most efficiently going from one control to another. In this way, they might be able to cross the stream, but they might not be able to. So 
they might have to research that. They might have to go up to the stream and see, can I cross it? And if they can cross it, well, where can they cross it? Can they cross it right here? Or do might they might have to go elsewhere around this stream to cross it? So finding the best route. Um, or the, simple, the, the fastest way might actually be to just go around and take the path. But those are sort of problems that they have to grapple with throughout an, an, an orienteering activity, depending on, of course, the, the, the surroundings. Um, children will also um, improve agility, endurance, and other physical skills, which, uh, of course, is very useful. Um, some other some other benefits that I really like is that it's quite easy to prepare. Um, you don't have to use a lot of resources uh, or equipment. And even if you feel right now that you don't really know what orienteering is, and you haven't uh, tried any activities, uh, you don't need a whole lot. You don't need a lot of expertise, which is very nice. And of course, least but not last or last but not least um, it provides opportunities for outdoor education all year round so you can you can do it in the winter in fact i was um i went to one of the schools here in saskatoon and uh, taught orienteering in in november and there was lots of snow and it was perfectly fun so uh, it doesn't have to be in the summer or spring or fall. You can do it all year round. So the first thing to do uh, once you decide that you want to do this in school or somewhere else is to figure out what area you want to use. So this might be your um, this might be your school ground, or it could be a city park, or it could be a park, um, a larger area outside the city. Um, but you want to try to pick an area that has a variety of features. So this might be some buildings, some trees, maybe some forest, but it doesn't have to be forest. As long as you have, it's nice to have a few trees, some fences maybe, some paths, maybe some topography. Here you can see a hill here, but you don't. it doesn't have, it can be completely flat. It doesn't really matter. But once you have picked your area, you want to research to see if there are any existing maps. And for some areas, there are already maps, even for your school ground or for the city park that you want to use, there might even be existing maps. And you don't have to use orienteering maps. Um, this here is an orienteering map that we made this fall of Gabriel DeMont Park in Saskatoon. It's located along the river. Uh, it has quite a bit of different, different types of terrain, but you, you don't have to use these kind of official orienteering maps, you can use even satellite images. Um, so even though, um, I guess the only thing that really is necessary is for the children to be able to um, identify symbols and objects on the map and match them to their surrounding. So for example, in this case here, you can see a satellite image of a school ground and a city park and you can use the satellite images as long as students can identify buildings on the map, playgrounds, paths, and here's a pond and trees. So again, a lot of clubs uh, that don't have access to a lot of maps, they end up using, um, or in, uh, they end up using satellite images. However, you can also create your basic orienteering maps quite easily. So out of this satellite image that you just saw, I created a very, very basic orienteering map. And um, so as you see here, these different um, features on the map were replaced by colored sort of symbols. And I was using PowerPoint for making this and it's not really as difficult as it might look. So in orienteering, we're usually using quite standard colors and uh, symbols. And uh, I will provide you with those symbols uh, later on if you want to, so that you can create, but it's quite easy to find online as well, exactly what type of colors and, and, and features. But again, it's not necessarily important for you all to use exactly what the national standards are. 
So um, in addition to maps, you also need some kind of checkpoint control um, that you hang out in the area that you're um, working in. So the sort of worldwide known type of control usually is made of fabric uh, and it's orange and white. It looks sort of similar to this. Uh, it's usually wired up so that it has this kind of three dimensional look to it. Uh, today, during competitions, they also use scanners so that you scan a fob uh, indicating that you have visited a control. Because of course you wanna prove that you've been there. Um, I don't use those electronic gadgets. I keep it very, very simple when I run orienteering activities. I use laminated sheets and it works really well. I basically print and laminate these type of sheets, put a hole in it and hang it uh, off a tree or a bush, a shrub or any other objects um, in, um, in the area where I'm working. And I can, I can, if you're interested in this, I can, I'm happy to share these type of resources. Um, so if you want a file with, um, with a PDF file with these, I'm happy to share that. So as you see here, um, they are numbered. And so you number them from one to however many you want. I usually put a little message saying, please don't remove it. Uh, it works most of the time, because of course you don't wanna have anyone messing with your activity. So that was map and maps and controls. And lastly, a compass. Now, I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about compasses in this webinar because um, you will likely not necessarily use it for your activity unless you really want to. And it really depends on how old the kids are that you're um, training. Um, most coaches, in Canada and throughout the world will agree that compasses uh, are not very useful for children that are younger than 10 years old because um, they can be very, um, they get distracted by this gadget and they don't look at the map. And they, and, and most activities or pretty much every activity that I'm running can be used, can be done without a, com a compass. So compasses are really, for participants or kids, students who are running in areas where you have very few landmarks and where you really need to figure out exactly where north is at all times. Um, so yeah, and, and another thing too is unless you are planning on running a series of sessions, uh, I would also not use a compass, even for older children. So uh, if I was teaching children 10 and above, I would introduce compasses maybe the second or the third session. So if I was just running one session, even for older kids, I would not introduce it. Instead, we use uh, landmarks in the, in the surroundings um, to hold the map correctly. So for example, when you run an activity, you probably want to ask the kids, so how do you know where north is? And some of them say, some of them point, yeah, north is that way. And then you ask why? Well, they because someone told them maybe. Uh, some of them will say that they look at the sun, which is great. Um, so we usually talk about other ways to figure out where north is. Um, and Again, the compass is really only used in orienteering to hold the map correctly, which is, of course, a very important part of orienteering. So uh, if you have any questions about any of that, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to create uh, a basic orienteering map. Uh, so what I do if I want to use, uh, say, PowerPoint or any other program that you can draw uh, sort of symbols in. Uh, I use, I start with a satellite image as you were seeing before, um, where I use, I find my area in Google map and then I switch to satellite image and then I print that area on the screen. So basically I print the screen, the area that I have right in front of me. And then I paste it into a program where I can sort of draw on top of that satellite image. 
and uh, you can, like I said before, you can use the map the way it is, or you can draw symbols on it. So just to demonstrate a little bit here, starting with the satellite image, and this is a, a school in Saskatoon that I was running an activity with, and um, and these are some of the symbols that I said we were often using for orienteering, different colors. For example, orange is always used for open land. And that's something that you have to explain to the students because it's not intuitive necessarily. Why is orange used for grass or open land, short grass? Well, that's just the way it is for orienteering. There is no necessarily logic to that. Um, white is used for thin forest, like forest that you can run very quickly through. Um, green is only used for forest when it's very dense. We also use more of an olive green for areas that should not be entered. So like, for example, settlements or maybe gardens or neighborhoods that we don't want the kids to run into away from the schoolyard. Gray is for buildings, um, dashed is for paths. Um, these thicker lines are for paved roads, fences, trees, water. It's pretty, some of them are, are very quite intuitive and easy to understand. So um, when I make these simple maps, I basically draw, we're using my program right on top of the satellite image and replace or basically put on the different symbols so paths and then building and uh, tarmac here, so a paved area. Um, um, I'm using pink, kind of a pinkish brown for paved and also for sand. So here we have a playground with sand. We have uh, a few ba uh, ball diamonds here. We have another play area here. And then I'm adding a background of orange because most of this is short grass. Most of it is open land. It's a, it's a park with a lot of short grass. And then I'm also adding some neighborhoods. So residential areas here with roads and buildings. And I'm putting that all in olive green to show that that's out of bounds. Kids should not go there. And usually we add a bit of a key so that kids remember the different symbols. So um, again, this is fairly easy. Uh, and I'm going to ask you to see if you want to start share, uh, working on your own map. And that's something that I will let you do for maybe about five minutes. I'm happy to take questions about map making and also uh, questions about this sort of first half of the, of, the, of the webinar. And so we'll take about five minutes. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put that one back and I want you to first see if you can find the area that you might wanna use. Now, some of you, you know where your school ground is, you know what you're gonna use to begin with. Some of you might not know exactly. So maybe you wanna look up a city park that, that you might wanna take even your own kids to or your uh, scout group to or your um, other outdoor group to. And um, so try to find an area on Google Maps that you think you might want to use. Um, bringing in, bring it into a, um, a program it can be anything that you like to use as a, as a, as a drawing program, even like I said, I use PowerPoint because I use it so much anyway, so that it, it seems to work. I think you can even use Word and then see if you can draw a few symbols on it. Um, so I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna leave you to do that for about five minutes, but like I said too, you're welcome to ask me questions throughout. There are a few questions in the chat. I don't know if you look yourself or if you uh, need to- Yeah, do you want to- um, let me see here. I don't, now that I have my screen shared, I don't know if I can get to my. That's to okay. Um, to, uh, there's one question. Uh, oh, sure. 
Um, how long would making a map like you made usually take? That's a good question. It really depends on how much details you want to put in it. Um, ideally, you might want to use make an make a map, go out and run an activity, and then come back and make more details. I would say that the one I made made right there would probably take maybe one or two hours, depending on how good you are with the program that you're using. It really is mostly about how good you are with the program. Um, but I would say one to two hours of making that. But again, if you want to come back and, and add, usually maps are work in progress, if you know what I mean. They are almost never completely done because you can always put more and more and more details in. And there's a specific question about what is X on the map? Right. So. Um, this is so X's are man made objects. And yeah, I didn't go through all of them, um, all of the, the key here. But yeah, as you see, man, so man, so here, for example, this is a playground. So sand, basically a large sandbox with an X in it. So that's a man made, that's basically a climbing structure. You have another climbing structure here. Um, one thing that we haven't included on this map that you could argue that at some point you might want to go in and add would be some some uh, benches. I know there is probably a bench there. There is another bench here. So like I said, you can always go out, run your activity or even go and do some field work, like look at where the benches and signs are and lampposts. You can put in a lot of things, but again, you can't put in everything because you have to kind of, I guess at some point you have to say, okay, that, that's enough detail. Any more questions? Uh, you, yeah, there's one more. A couple more. Would you get students to make the map? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it depends on their age for sure. Um, one thing that I um, that I know that the teacher of this uh, school wanted to do with the kids was to use this base, this really basic map, and go and uh, find more details. So, and that is actually a really fun activity on its own. Make a super basic map get the kids to draw in other things, like new things, bench, benches, um, lamp poles or garbage cans. And uh, yeah, so you can, you know, yes, you can, you can have them make the whole map from the very beginning, especially if they're older children. Um, but even younger children can probably use the map to add extra things, for sure. Do you have any suggestions for map making in forested areas? Um, yes, uh, for sure. Um, I guess it depends on, again, like for example, going back to this area here, um, Gabriel de Mont Park has a fair amount of forest. Now it does have paths as well, and it has some playgrounds and stuff. So usually i mean yeah it would if you make a map like i said before it's good an area an area for orienteering is good if there are sort of features in it and and of course even a forested area there will be tons of features there will be paths otherwise it would you know maybe be a little harder to use to use that area but paths you could you you would um, map the paths you would map even like big boulders you would map uh, maybe some streams and, and so yes um, any any of course any area can be used for orienteering any area can be mapped um, I, I again I prefer if there are a lot of different features in it so that that helps students to orient orient themselves basically does that answer that question or did I miss something in that okay um, there's a couple of specific questions about PowerPoint. One is, how did you add the shape of water using PowerPoint? And could you model how to create a new map in PowerPoint? I'm unable to, unsure about how to fill in color on PowerPoint for irregular shapes. Aha, uh -huh. now I'm, I'm very happy to, because again, because I, I'm gonna go back here. Oh yeah, here. Um, 
because I asked you if you wanted to make a map, uh, if many of you are very interested in making maps, I can go into PowerPoint myself and, and show you more. Um, I, um, yeah, I should be keeping the time a little bit better than I'm doing right now. Leah, can you tell me what time it is? It is 7.30. I wonder if you should finish what you have planned and then people who are really keen on maps, we could yeah. dive into that a bit more That's at the end. That's kind of what I was thinking. Um, and because I've been answering a few questions now, like did anyone, while we were answering questions here, did anyone look up their area that they might want to use on their computer? Yeah, did you? Now, did you put it in a, um, or even if you didn't, do you want to, do you want to share what you have done? Because the next thing that I was going to do was basically see if anyone wanted to share and not necessarily sharing your map, but just kind of an idea of getting an idea of how many different varieties of, 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 um, of areas that we can use. It would be so I don't know if you wanted to do that, Shannon. I know you raised your hand and I yeah, I found my map and it's pretty easy to um like to print screen, but then I was lost <laughs> once I got into PowerPoint. So I was like, I don't know how to make any symbols. So I'll have yeah. to stay on and figure that out with you. That all. would be great. <laughs> now do you wanna just share you wanna share what you have, even just the uh, satellite image? Yeah, I can oh I can share my screen. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Sorry, I have a bunch of stuff popping up. Okay, I think I just grabbed so, so I might have to stop sharing mine. I'm just going to stop sharing mine. Can you see it there? Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty. That's great. Oh, and I love Wilson Park, AE -A -E, um, Wilson Park. That would be a lovely place. Yes. And is there any particular area of that park that you are thinking about using? Well, I have used it for, we have a Get Outside Kids Club in Regina. So we've mm -hmm. actually taken the kids from Rick Hansen Park and we've done a one and a half hour hike around the, around here. And then we go on the islands and see the birds and do some stuff and come back. So that's awesome. I, I used to live in Regina for quite a long time. And um, I used to come to Boreal Island all the time because I was craving that sort of natural setting and, um, we did a lot of fun stuff there. So yeah, that setting would be, that would be perfect. And yes, I'm, I'm very happy to help you um, kind of figure out how to make symbols. Is, is there anyone else who wants to uh, share any area, any satellite image, or just, it would be wonderful getting an idea of what, what you are making maps of. But it's okay if you don't. Leah, do you see anyone having their hands up? Oh, perfect, here we go. Great. Where is this? Do you wanna tell us where this is? Did, is he muted? I can't really see. Yeah, sorry, I think I'm unmuted now. Okay, perfect. You can hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, this is our campground not too far from our school in our town. And where, which town are you in? Foam Lake. Okay, wonderful. So this is our school right here. So we, quite often, I take my phys ed classes over into this area. This is our, there's a creek that runs through here and it's all treed and there's a walking, hiking trail through and a campground and an open, lots of grass open range. And this is all land that we can explore at any time up and down the creek that all, actually goes all the way up into here. We can go all the way through. Wow, you're so lucky. That is beautiful. Honestly, that would be a wonderful place for orienteering. Lots to explore for the kids. And that is to keep in mind to make it that way. You know, you want to have them explore. You want to have them want to go further. Yeah, for sure. That's beautiful. But again, um, any area, really any area can be used. Um, so, some schoolyards uh, work perfect. And I would say that there's very few schoolyards that wouldn't work uh, unless they are completely concrete. But even that sometimes um, people do use orienteering or do orienteering in areas that are a lot of buildings and concrete. So anything is possible. 
Does anyone else want to share? I'll give it a few more seconds to see if anyone else comes up. Um, Malin, I, I wouldn't like to share my question, but do you mind if I just ask you a, a quick question? No, no, absolutely. Um, I don't, hopefully this isn't a dumb question, but um, what's the rationale for sort of copying into PowerPoint and sort of coloring over top? Like why, could you not just sort of print that Google Earth image and then create a bit of a legend with colors based on what's what's right there? Like what's the, I'm just wondering what the rationale is for sort of transforming it on PowerPoint. Right, so, um, so like I did say as well, uh, before I started putting symbols on, uh, a lot of people use it as a, just a satellite image. You can use the satellite image as long as kids can identify features on the map and match them to features in their surrounding. And so really that is the only thing that's really needed. You can use any map um, as long as you can match features with objects in the surrounding. Uh, and then it, I guess it's up to you to really teach students to be able to do just that. Um, the reason I, I mean, I, I guess I'm coming from the orienteering side of things where we make orienteering maps uh, with certain symbols on it. So um, I often do it because of that background and also for clarity. Um, I wanna make sure that students can identify different features such as paths, um, buildings and, um, paved areas and paths and, and, and different human-made objects. Um, sometimes it's very easy to identify those things um, on a satellite image, sometimes it's not. I think it depends on the area and how good that satellite image is. But once you get really close, sometimes it gets quite blurry. So it can be difficult, but again, I know it's done and it's not unusual to use uh, satellite images. Yeah, thanks for that question. Thank you. Okay. Um, there's another question about maps. Um, how do you indicate topography? Right, good question. Very, very good question. Um, so there is something called contours, um, which we use in, uh, in orienteering to show hills. And uh, so that's a very good question. I'm going to share my screen here again to show you Let me see here. I think that's where we are. Here. Yes. So for this map here, it was very flat. So actually there is a there is a hill a little bit further off, but this particular area is pretty flat. So I did not bother putting any contour lines there. Um, sorry, I'm gonna go and see if I can get back to the Gabriel DeMont one. Yeah, so it's a little faint in this one because the map is quite um, small, but on the left, sorry, on the right, on the right hand side, you can see lines. And I, yeah, I do apologize, they are quite faint, but what you do with brown lines is that you show uh, heels. Now, you will not necessarily know until you get there if they're going up or going down, but you will show with gr uh, brown lines, linear features. Um, and if the lines are really close together, that means that it's really, really steep. If they are further apart, it means that it's uh, a less steep hill. Uh, I don't have a better picture of that right here, but if you were to uh, Google uh, orienteering maps, you will get a really good sense of what I'm talking about. When I'm, and contour lines, I would say, depending on your area, is it's a quite technical thing. Um, if I was just doing one session with my kids in the schoolyard, I probably would not necessarily talk a lot about contour lines. It might be a second thing I do. Uh, some of you might do several sessions and that will definitely be something that I would add on um, for a, a shorter session. Maybe I wouldn't. It depends. Sometimes you don't want to overload and it depends on the, on the, on the age, of course, as well. 
So let's go back here. Sorry, there's a couple more things. One yes. person commented in the chat that there's a they submitted a link to a contour map generator. So um, just so you know that you can look back at that maybe. Um, and someone else has their map ready to share. I think I'm going to take one more. Well, there's one more they want to share. I'm going to stop sharing then. Great. So yeah, do you want to talk about this a little bit? You might have to unmute yourself. Let me see here. Um, can you click on your microphone to unmute? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes, perfect. Okay. Um, <laughs> one second, my screen went blank. It was so weird. Okay, so my school is in this area right. and we have access to this creek and it goes beyond there as well. Wow. Yeah. That's excellent. Yes. No, absolutely. Do you have any bridges? Can they cross anywhere? Um, there is a bridge over here. You can't see it on the map. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, yeah, that's great. I mean, it's lovely. Lots of, it looks like lots of forest and are there maybe any other paths inside that forest here and there? And you can, yeah, there's a path all the way along. You can barely see it with the map that I got, but yeah. it, you just see my arrow goes here and yeah. then it splits off into different directions until we get there. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, 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 it's wonderful. Like it, that would be an excellent area as well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you so Thank much you. for sharing. Okay, anyone, any last person who wants to share? Okay, I think it's time for me to start sharing mine again here. I'm, oops, I'm going to go back here. Okay, yeah, so make sure to stay on if you want to see how I add symbols on in, um, in PowerPoint, I'll do that towards the end. So once you have your map, and again, it doesn't matter what type of map it is, uh, if it's a satellite image or if it's um, a map where you have replaced those um, images with symbols, then you add your control markers or basically your checkpoints um, so that the students know where to look for controls. So as you see in this one, I made a uh, orienteering course. And when I talk about courses, I talk about this series of checkpoints. So series of checkpoints is called a, a, um, an orienteering course. So here we have a course with 14 controls. And usually you connect them. Um, and that's not necessary. Um, that's a very common thing to do. It's a common practice to do in orienteering to connect the controls. It's mainly to, to let the participants know which order to take them in. Um, and usually in competitions, you take them in orders. Um, you can tell kids that they need to take them in order or not to take them in order. It doesn't really matter, it all depends on what type of activity you want to put together. Um, you can also put together really short courses for younger children and longer ones. In this case, 14 controls uh, probably takes uh, quite a bit of time. So younger children probably can't complete that many. Um, and again, even if you have a satellite image, you can still, of course, put your controls down. In this one, I haven't numbered them, but they really should be numbered. Uh, as in this case, because the controls that you put down, of course, should have these numbers so that students know, yes, I'm here and I found number three. And um, so after you make your map with your orienteering course, you will go and set up your controls. Uh, you might wanna go out and make sure that there are areas 
tracking your controls in so that you don't put them on the map and then go out and realize that you can't hang them anywhere. Um, but if you know your area fairly, fairly well and you know there are places to hang them, you make your map first and then you print your map and you go out and you hang up your controls right before you are running your activity. Um, and then of course um, you introduce your students to the map. I like to do that outside. Now, some of those things can be done indoors. You might have a little bit of time before you go outdoors and you can do some of that math sort of work beforehand. Um, but I do like to do it outside. Um, so what I normally do, uh, especially if I run a very short school activity where I might only have say uh, 45 minutes and that's not uncommon that I introduce students to the map and run an activity all of that within 45, 50 minutes. And so that's pretty cramped, but it's definitely possible. If you have a lot of time, you can do this several times over a course of a few weeks, which would be ideal so that you can introduce the children to maps and cardinal directions in a more sort of um, slower pace. But I usually ask the students, you know, questions about the map. So they look at the map and I ask them, where do you, what do you think this map shows? So we go through different sort of features on the map. Where do you think you are is a good question. Like, so then the students look at the map and try to figure out where they could possibly be on that map. Um, we talk about map symbols, or if you wanna use satellite images, that's kind of cool as well, because a tree on a satellite image doesn't necessarily look like a tree uh, in real life. So trying to get the students to understand how something looks from the above, it's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, so making sure that they understand symbols or how something looks on the map. And then of course, cardinal direction. Um, both map symbols and cardinal directions can be taught using games. Uh, if again, if you have a lot more time. Um, and when it comes to cardinal directions, um, we often talk about how do you know where north is? And it's quite nice to hear, it's, it, it becomes quite nice of a discussion with the children because they sometimes they know it, but they don't know why they know it. They know it maybe because their teacher told them so. Uh, some of them will figure out that they can use the sun if the sun is out um, and figuring out, of course, where south is as opposed to north. So it becomes actually a very nice discussion. And uh, some of them will bring up and saying, well, we can use a compass. And then uh, I say, yes, absolutely, a compass is great, but what if you don't have a compass? And so we talk about different ways of understanding cardinal directions. And uh, so the two things that are needed when you use a map is exactly that, map symbols and understanding how to hold the map. And of course, in order to know how to hold the map so that you don't hold it upside down, um, you have to know the cardinal direction. Uh, and then I usually let the students loose in the area. Uh, I often have them work in smaller groups so that they build confidence. And then of course I make sure that there are uh, a few adults in the area kind of checking in with the groups now and then. Um, actually, before we run on or go on here, does anyone have any questions about sort of running that running the activity running the orienteering activity there's many many different ways of course to do this and again the main thing is it depends on how much time you have so what i normally do to make it more fun um is uh again i was saying before that i often introduce map symbols and cardinal directions using games if I have time. Again, if I have 45 minutes to do a school activity, we don't have time, we don't have time to do games in the beginning uh, to introduce these things. Uh, instead, I make sure that there is plenty of time for them 
to uh, run the course and find the controls. Now, to make it fun out on the course, find the controls, to, to make it uh, important enough for the kids to actually find the controls, I sometimes build in a treasure hunt. And so I often attach things to the controls. I sometimes attach letters to each control and um, have the letters make a word. So if they find all the controls, they can make a word or a sentence. Um, sometimes I put clues on the different controls so that the more clues you gather, the closer you get to, um, to uh, knowing where the treasure is. Um, so, so that kind of goes, that goes all over well with the students. Um, and you can even do these things even if you don't have a treasure at the end. So sometimes there's just no time to have a treasure, but you can still have students um, figure out secret messages uh, using the letters of the controls or secret words. I, all, I sometimes also attach riddles to this, uh, the controls so that they have to find the next control to get the answer of the riddle. That kind of uh, gets the students going a little bit more. Uh, sometimes I put pieces of stories on the control so that they read a story as they go through the different controls. And so those three things can be done for really short activities, uh, even if you only have um, 50 minutes or so. If you do a series of sessions, you can start doing number four and five here. Uh, memory map is quite fun, but it would not be something you do um, in the very beginning. A memory map uh, is where you don't give the students a map. Instead, on each control, you give a, you, sh you show a map, um, or you, you, um, you display a map showing how to get to the next control. So instead of running with a map, there is a map sitting on each control and you have to remember how to get to the next control by looking at the map. Um, so that's quite advanced, but it's something fun to do at sort of the end of a series of, of sessions. Uh, and then of course, um, once the kids get good at this, they might wanna race against each other. Maybe they have teams, you might have teams that run uh, against each other and a bit of a friendly competition. You can always do that. Um, so I have resources left, but I'm happy to take uh, questions at this point. Are there any questions before we go on to talk a little bit about resources and what resources I will provide here? I'm happy to provide other resources as well. And of course, then we will talk a little bit more about PowerPoint and how that works. But if there are any questions about how to run activities, I haven't talked about any specific games other than the, the letters and the riddles and stuff, just because it really depends on how much time you have. And of course, now with COVID, some games such as tag, which is a very nice, you know, there's so many different variations of tag that you can, that you can play um, with cardinal directions and so, but we haven't been playing uh, tag in orienteering for a long time just because of COVID. So. So Leah, are there any questions? Yes, there is one. Um, how do you how do you have the children not follow each other and instead follow the map? It is a very good question, and it it isn't very easily solved. Um, but you can, depending on how well you know your children, uh, you can have them start at different numbers because. Um, you don't have to start at control one. Um, depending on how you set up your course, you could have uh, one group starting at control one. You could have the next one starting at control three, the next group at, at five or, or seven or so on and so forth. Or even you can have some groups starting from the back. So um, that is probably the easiest way to solve that. Um, and uh, otherwise, I mean, I find too that the kids usually spread out pretty quick, but it depends on how many groups you have and how many children, and of course, how old they are and so on. 
Were there any more questions, Leo? Um, yeah, there's another one just came in. I don't think I've missed anything, but if I have, feel free to retype it or to speak up. Um, there's a concern about supervision safety with many different groups starting at different locations and potentially crossing roads, streams. Right. From a I lab. It again depends on your on your area. So if your area is very complex, I would definitely, and, and so it depends on the area and it depends on how old the kids are. If you have an area that there are hazards like roads and streams and stuff, I wouldn't, I would actually walk the course with the children. I would make sure that I had enough uh, helpers so that I could take the kids and walk the, the course. Uh, again, depending on how old they are. Uh, if you don't feel like you want to let them loose, I would make sure I had enough, I don't know, parent volunteers or other um, teachers to help me so that each group or every two groups had a, a person, an, an adult. For, my, for example, for my, for my sessions, my, my sessions that I run in Saskatoon, um, kids under eight need an adult to go with them at all times. Um, so yes, it is important depending on your, if you have a, if you have a school ground um, with say a, a fence around it or a very specific area where you can see the children the whole time, uh, it, it would be different for sure. But that's a great question. But in the beginning, students are not necessarily very good with the map. So again, going with them, uh, having adults go with them and even actually walking the course together is not a bad thing. It helps them a lot. There is a question. Um, will a session, will there be a session in the future to teach about using compasses with orienteering? We could do that for sure, for sure. Um, I'm happy. So really, a lot of people think orient orienteering is, 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 or basically using compass is exactly the same thing as orienteering. Um, orienteering is really just using a map to get from control to control or from A to B basically. Um, the big thing about the compass is making sure that you're holding your map correctly. So if you, if you know exactly, if you know where the different cardinal directions are without the compass, um, you don't, again, you don't need it. Um, to take bearings um, is really, I mean, it, it's fun, but um, if you have, again, if you have landmarks, it's not as, as, uh, as needed. And again, I would not use it uh, with younger children um, because it, it just takes away from learning to use the map. Uh, but I'm happy to do a, um, yeah, I'm happy to do a session for using the compass now. I must say it would be, it's hard to do a webinar on it. It's, it's, it's possible. Uh, it's almost like I want to go out there with you. <laughs> um, but we, yeah, we can figure out how to do one if, if there's a lot, if there's enough interest. And of course, it doesn't have to be a group of 30. I, I could make a, I could make a smaller seminar for that for sure. Any other questions? I think that's all I've seen come through. Okay, perfect. Um, just gonna briefly go through the resources that I have put together. Um, so again, making orienteering maps, um, I provided a little bit of information and, and I will provide a little bit more for those of you who stay. Um, this first link here is from um, the Alberta Orienteering Association. And uh, that one talks about uh, mostly using satellite images, so Google Earth or um, uh, Google Map. And the second one is a mapping program. Uh, and so this is for those of you who are interested in digging a little bit deeper into making maps. And so it's a free, it's an open source orienteering uh, mapping program. And I'm happy, more than happy to help you uh, learn how to use it. And it's really for those of you who are very interested in making apps. Um, it's not difficult. It just takes a little bit of 
kind of getting used to the software. Um, but I'm kind of in that space right now that I'm learning to use it and, and I actually love it. But, you know, I, I love maps. I love making maps. Um, so I, again, if that is something that interests you, please contact me and I'm happy to, to work through some of those things that I had problems with. Um, there are lots of really nice orienteering games. And uh, again, I won't have time to go in through anything specific. And it depends so much on the time that you have, the area that you have, and the children, the age of the children. But there's lots of resources here uh, and lots of really fun uh, and educational games. And I think that's basically all I have. So um, again, any questions, I'm happy to take questions and then I'm happy to to stay on and uh, talk a little bit more about what I use in PowerPoint. It was awesome timing. It is exactly eight o'clock. Okay, great. You Very did perfect. So, um, so no more questions, Leah? Uh, there's a comment that it would be great to have an actual adult orienteering session outdoors this spring, summer. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So I lots of ideas. I totally agree. Um, we can definitely talk more about that. In fact, um, Leah, I know that even people who can't be here today might want um, to contact me or you and either either of them is fine. Um, do you want to use that orienteering at Sask Outdoor? I'll put that email address in the chat right now. So if you have orienteering questions. Yes, uh, because I'm sure that you know, when, once we end here, you might have even more questions. And uh, also you could put that uh, so that people who didn't come tonight um, can see it as well. So um, yeah, all right. Um, yeah, if you wanna stay on uh, and ask more questions, uh, please do so. If you wanna stay on and uh, see the little demo that I will do, please feel, to do, feel free to do that as well. But otherwise, if you need to go, Good night and hope to see you again.